Welcome back to the Yards After College podcast here on KSLSports.com and the KSL Sports app. We are your hosts, as always, presenting you the best in locals in the NFL from the state of Utah. I'm Sam Farnsworth of KSL Channel 5, uh, sports anchor <clears throat> over there. Kyle Ireland, as always, digital sports producer and locals in the NFL insider for KSLSports.com as well. And here we are, another week come and gone in the NFL, Kyle. Halloween, Halloween weekend. You know, one thing I like about football at Halloween time of year is seeing all the fans dressing up and uh, kind of kind of the themes you see throughout the stadiums. The big question is, have you ever dressed up in a Halloween costume for a sporting event? I have not. That's actually a really good question. I, I've i never gone to the length of dressing up. And I think it's not the fact that, like, I, I don't want to, like, be in public like that because, like, that's fine. I don't really care. Um <laughs> I like some people are like, oh, I'm not going to go out like in a costume, right? Like that part doesn't bother mm-hmm. me at all. It's the comfort. Like, I don't want to like be in like some oh, yeah, I got uncomfortable you. like outfit for like two and a half hours, three hours, watching especially a sporting if it's cold. Event. Yeah. And like putting a jacket on over like a costume. Yeah. Like, I just don't want to deal with that. You can't. Like, yeah. you can't I, put I, a jacket on. I wore my Halloween yeah. costume the other day and it wasn't like very comfortable. Like I was just like straight up, like my wife bought me some stuff. She was like, here, you need to throw this on for a picture. And I'm like, okay. So I threw it on, we took the picture and then I took half of it off because it wasn't comfortable. Like, I'm like, I'm not going to just like sit, sit around like this, let alone watch a basketball game or a football game. You know, have you It's Halloween almost it's, it's no, I haven't either, but I was just thinking about it. You know, it's Halloween every week in the nfl pretty much especially depending on which fan base you're a part of like the raiders right yeah Yeah. the raiders fans are amazing Uh, i saw a lot of them up close and personal the ones that would travel to denver um some of those famous raider fans that you always see on tv they'd make the trip out to denver all the time too there's some there's some regulars in denver there's a guy called orange vader dresses like darth vader but it's all orange to every bronco game there's this guy that dressed as I don't know. I can't remember his official title, the Denver Leprechaun or something like that. So it, there was Barrel Man back in the day. And so dressing up as a costume in a costume to an NFL game, it seems like it makes sense, especially this time of year. But I was kind of chatting with you a little earlier, Kyle, <laughs> before this podcast began about there's a fan at every Utah Jazz basketball game during the holidays who dresses as Buddy the Elf. My wife wants me to dress as Buddy the Elf for Halloween this year so she can dress as the the girl. I can't remember her name. Jovi or Joe, whatever her name was. Anyway, now I'm thinking I need to go to the jazz game dressed as Buddy the Elf and sit a couple seats behind this guy that does it every year and just to kind of play games with everyone. I uh, <laughs> I wish that you would have dressed as Buddy the Elf and you would have been at Mile High yesterday in that freezing cold weather and then seeing how long <laughs> you wanted to stay as Buddy the Elf. Because like, no, you, you mentioned these guys in Denver. It's like, if he's going to like that to every game, like, Sure, it's October right now. Like, it's December 10th. Like, is that guy having a fun time at the Broncos game? Like, you can't be, especially watching that team the last few years. Freezing cold, watching terrible football. I just, I can't imagine doing it, Sam. I'm out on the costumes at sporting events. I'm out. Well, all right. Good good answer. Um, I'm all for it. I just, you know, I've been in this career long enough to know that I don't get to go to games as a fan anymore, so I don't know that I'll ever do it. But, uh, yeah, we'll leave it at that. Happy Halloween, everyone. Let's talk some NFL, especially let's talk about our local connections in the NFL every week. I mean, it's just amazing how many people are rising up and doing something in the NFL that went to high school in our state of Utah, that went to college in our state of Utah, but especially these high school guys, excuse me, that's, uh, I'll, you know, before I get to my three stars, I just want to throw out just real quick, like Simi Fihoko, the Brighton high star. He was a Mr. Football here in, in Utah. And there he is suddenly making a play for the Chargers, getting his first career touchdown. That was pretty cool to see, right? Yeah, no, it was awesome. It actually caught me off guard because he, he like had been on the practice squad with the the Cowboys the last couple of years and, kind of bouncing back and forth to active roster. Then he gets picked up by the char- or sorry, by the Steelers um earlier mm-hmm. this year. And then Steelers only had him for like, I don't know, a week or two. And then uh he moves on to the yeah. Chargers. 
And he's gotten some run with them this season through the first seven weeks of the year. But I I was just, it was first quarter. Like, I was not expecting that to be him out there. Play- like, at the end of the game, when I'm, like, looking at box scores, it'll be like, oh, like, he got some special team snaps or whatever. Like, I was like, whoa, whoa, whoa is that Fahoko? Like, he just caught yeah. a touchdown yeah. on Sunday Night Football. Yeah. That was awesome. So, uh, kind of caught me awesome. off guard, but pretty cool. Yeah, you saw Herbert kind of making his reads through his progression. So, I mean, it wasn't like Fahoko was – that was yeah. the target there. But he ran his route. He was there when Herbert looked his way. He made the catch and got in. So, that was really, really – Yeah, it was cool amazing, to too, because it, like – it the way that the the route tree kind of went with all those guys, like it cleared his crossing route out. Yeah. So he was like wide open and had a really like easy path to the end zone. Like it honestly, like it could have been scripted as him being like the number one target on that play based off of how it ended up. So yeah. I don't know, pretty cool. And like he waltzed right into the end zone. So, you know me, Kyle, uh, I've kind of turned this three stars each week into um, some honorable mentions and whatnot. It's going to groan, but I will stick to my three stars. We'll give Simi an honorable mention this week for getting into the end nice. zone for the first time in his career. Um, I think that's the, the I think that's the first honorable mention that I'll allow. Like, yeah, like, oh, it's OK. <laughs> first career TD. Congrats, Simi. Yeah, that, that's the those are those moments you never <clears throat> he'll have that forever. He scored a touchdown in the NFL. So that's really, really cool. But these are the heavy hitters now. These are my three stars of the week. And there's several uh, locals that did enough to be considered as my third star, as my three stars. And I'll, I'll, I'll kind of preface it with this. As people are listening to this, you might not agree with the order that they're in, but I think (laughs) who who I put at number one, you're not going to expect it again, but at the same time, very deserving. So I'll start with number three. Third star. Okay, my third star, Kyle. It's none other than the Weber State Wildcat, Rashid Shahid for the New Orleans Saints. I, You know me. I am all on board the Rashid Shahid bandwagon. In fact, I might be the conductor of this train. But uh, I, I picked him, I think, as my breakout local this year. Uh, or, or something. I picked him for something in our local preseason picks. I've just been on board with him. The way he emerged last year, you know, he's lightning in a bottle. Anytime he gets his hands on the ball, he's got a chance to make some big plays happen and uh, to, um, you know, get into the end zone. And that's exactly what we've seen him, what we have seen him doing throughout this season. And then again on Sunday against the Colts, which by the way, was a game loaded with locals doing stuff. Uh, which almost made me want to keep all three of my stars out of that game. But, but yeah, Rashid Shahid, three catches, 153 yards. Do the math. That's a 51-yard average per catch. Uh, and his longest was 58. So you know all three were just long shots. And he he got into the end zone on uh, on one of those as well. So Rashid just showing off that speed, that athleticism, the ability to to make big plays happen when he's got the ball in his hands. And then on top of that, Four punts returned for 46 yards. An 11.5-yard punt return average is actually pretty good in the NFL. It was one of those things, Sam, where I was watching it live and I was torn. I was happy for Sheed, but <laughs> my, my gosh. He got behind my team's defense, Sam, and I was like, he's he's gone. He's he's so fast, man. <laughs> and it's, I don't know. That that team is so interesting. Like you mentioned, like that game had a ton of local guys in it, and I'm sure you'll, you'll mention some here in a little bit, but I just – Watching that game, I was just blown away by the talent that comes out of this state. And to have a guy come out of Weber like him, like Taron Johnson making a big play on Sunday Night Football a couple of weeks ago, like it's amazing that like it's not just the BYU and Utah guys or even Utah State with Jordan Love. Like it's like Weber State, Southern Utah, these high school guys that didn't play college here, but, you know, are you know, prep players out of the state of Utah. Like it's just amazing. And uh, it just shows like the, the talent that's here, uh, the coaching that is being done. And to have a guy like Rashid Shahid, who, I mean, he, he really kind of came on like midway through his rookie year last year, but now it's like, he's, he's like the saints number one target and he's halfway Mm -hmm. into his second year in the league. Like, right. Like, I mean, they've got Michael Thomas and, Taysom Hill and Juwan Johnson like I mean 
they've got other guys that that can make plays. Alvin Kamara is probably their number one wideout, actually. But you know, as like <laughs> as far as a non running back guy, uh, he's their number one wideout now, and like that's pretty crazy to say because Michael Thomas, like he was like a top three wide receiver, you know, a few years ago when he was healthy, and now Rashid Shahid, like it shows that he's not just one of those guys that is fast and like ran a good 40 time. Like he's a, he's a complete player. He's a good wide receiver. And uh, I'm excited to see how he continues on. Okay. So he's my third star. Let's get to number two. Second star. Second star. I I, want to mention uh, really quick too. Rashid Shahid, uh, he had a 44-yard catch, which was just an ath- – the, the catch that he made, it was a very athletic play going up with other uh, – and, and he comes double down and kind of rips it away, right? Rips it away, double coverage. Just amazing. So it's not just the speed, his ability to, to be able to take the ball away in the air. The guy who threw the ball, that's my second star, Taysom Hill. Uh, to, see, to see Taysom take a shot downfield – when we know he's really not an NFL quarterback anymore, he has the ability to do so, but we know he's not going to be an every day, every down under center guy, probably at any other point through the rest of his career. But to see him take that shot downfield, uh, you see that ball go up in the air and you see the double coverage and you're like, Oh dear, (laughs) what's happening. But Rashid was there. I mean, it was still a good throw. Rashid was there to come down with it. Hill completes a pass for 44 yards. Hill catches a pass. For 14 yards. How many times have we seen this throughout his career where he's completed a pass? He's caught a pass and he's rushed the ball. He ran the ball nine times for 63 yards and two touchdowns. Taysom Hill, I think it's been awesome to see him get more and more carries, bulk carries, not just like spot carries, like four or five carries a game. He's had nine carries a couple of times this year. Um, And he had nine on Sunday for 63 yards. Like I said, the two touchdowns, a 20 yarder. Uh, on that first touchdown and just to see that where Taysom's at in his career I've been thinking as we've been watching him this season that you know maybe in a year or two things start to fizzle out and it's kind of the end or maybe he makes a switch like I wouldn't be shocked if Taysom Hill he's got the ability and the skill set to make a switch over to like a safety or something and maybe extend his career two more years doing that I don't know but um, but to, to kind of have that mindset that I was having and then see him succeed the way he did on Sunday, it goes to show that he still has enough to be a difference maker in the Saints offense. I just want to shout out the NFL's instant replay system because that saved him for your second star. Because that thing yeah. was rolled an interception, Sam. Yeah. It was a, yes. it was a pick <laughs> until they went to the replay, and then they said no. <laughs> Rashid Jade caught that first before it was ripped away. So. Congrats to Taysom on a nice completion there. But yeah, I uh, I did a little video. You've seen me do it a few times this year. Uh, I took a couple week break uh, after I had some surgery, but I uh, I did it for the first few weeks of the season. Uh, ramped it back up last night where I did a kind of a recap video on uh, Instagram and TikTok. And this uh, week I, I decided to focus on Taysom because of his game yesterday. But I, uh, I just, <clears throat> it made me think, because you mentioned all of those stats there. StatMuse kind of put out his, like, game yesterday as well. And we've always talked about him as, like, you know, the Swiss Army knife that he's been nicknamed as. It's uh, It made me think. <clears throat> it's interesting. Like, where is he most effective on the field? Because they've utilized him as, like, a tight end mainly in the last couple of seasons um, since Sean Payton left. And he he plays, like, the, the wildcat. But, like, he's, he's named up you know, position wise as a quarterback, but then mm-hmm. like he comes in, he's more like a wildcat running back and he has like 25 rushing touchdowns. Now that's where he's gotten his uh, touchdowns this year as well. Three touchdowns all came rushing, but then they target him sometimes as a receiver or tight end. Like, where do you think he's most effective now? Because I mean, we talked about, or you mentioned how, you know, he's probably not going to play quarterback or whatever, like throwing the ball moving forward in the league, but it's just, it's interesting. Like, is he more effective as a receiver or just one of those direct snap wildcat guys? Should they hand hand the ball off to him like a Kamara kind of a thing? Um, I don't know. I, it just made me kind of wonder, like, what, what should the Saints use him as moving forward? Because 
he really wasn't like super active the first five, six mm-hmm. weeks of the season. And then the last couple of weeks, the Saints have ramped up like what his workload has been. I don't know if he was dealing with like a, a slight, you know, injury or something. They hadn't mentioned anything, but it just made me kind of think like, where do you think he's most effective? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question because <clears throat> I kind of feel like he would be a really good kind of a, a slot tight end type, you know, um, but he's he would be a smaller one for sure in the yeah. NFL. Um, and and so maybe you don't get the favorable matchups that that you like with like a Travis Kelsey or a or a Kittle or someone like that going up against a strong safety or a linebacker where, you know, you've got the size advantage um sometimes the speed advantage now Taysom would definitely have some speed advantages against uh you know a linebacker or or you know a, a safety that might come down and cover him in that situation but he doesn't necessarily have the maybe the height advantage or anything like that um but I kind of feel like that might be where his career could extend the most however you know he proved proved it wrong yesterday that that <laughs> I'm I'm not a big fan of I'm not a big fan of the of the the wildcat type you know situational offense in any situation whether it's college or the pros but if it works i guess you got to keep doing it and it's sure. working in the situations that they're putting Taysom in so if that's it keeps thing, working it's, it's interesting sam because like you you mentioned that but like alvin kamara kind of mentioned it yesterday in his post game remarks as well where Taysom they know what's coming and he's still like unstoppable yeah it's like the tush exactly. push kind of thing right like where it's like, yeah. although the commanders did stop the tush push yesterday. Um, but like, yeah. it's like that where it's like, we know that Taysom's going to be the one running the ball here. Like he's in at quarterback, Derek Carr's out of the game. He's on the sidelines. Like, I, I wish that there was a little bit more creativity to how they use him because right. I feel like that was how Sean Payton used him. And I mean, I, I think back to like that Thanksgiving day game a few years ago with Drew Brees and him, where they just both had an awesome game on Thanksgiving and he was utilized in, you know, pretty much every single way that yeah. game. Yeah. I think it, that that makes him more fun to watch. I don't know if, <laughs> if that's how the Saints want to use him. Right. But like, it's just more fun for me. Um, but anyway, I just thought that that was interesting from Alvin Kamara that like, even though, you know, right now that Taysom's taking the direct snap, he's running the wildcat, not throwing the ball. Mm-hmm. It's kind of hard to stop. So. It is indeed. I, I would maybe a double pass. We need to get a double pass this year. Car out to Taysom and let Taysom launch one down to Sheet or something like that. That'd be cool. Nice. Um, well, you know, and and I, I I know here I am doing some honorable mentions again, and maybe it, maybe I don't call him an honorable mention, but since we're talking about this game, Zach Moss deserves a little shout out here because again we see another week go by with Jonathan Taylor back in the Colts offense. Jonathan Taylor getting more carries. But Zach Moss being just as productive as Jonathan Taylor, he reeled off a 41-yarder. Taylor had a 42-yarder. Zach Moss did get into the end zone in the game, too. So uh, congrats to Zach Moss. But he does not get a star. Take it away. He just gets a pat on the back. The first star goes to this guy. First star. First star. And I told you, you probably might be shocked. Maybe shocked isn't the word, but surprised. I'm giving my first star to none other than um, Seahawks linebacker Bobby Wagner for a couple reasons. Seahawks, here they are suddenly on top of the NFC West. They're leading the division. And who is the heart and soul and center of that defense? It's Bobby Wagner still. Like, how many years is this guy in the NFL? And it's not like he's that old, but he's been in the NFL for a while, especially at his position, and he's still playing at the very top. He ranks fifth in the league in total tackles. 76 total tackles. He's still the menace uh, that that he is for opposing offenses. Yesterday, he led his team with 13 tackles in their win. And so shout out to Bobby Wagner, still doing his thing, still doing it at a high level, at a Pro Bowl level. Um, you know, we give a lot of love to Fred Warner, and deservedly so. Fred is becoming what Bobby Wagner once was. But I don't think Bobby Wagner – is just moving aside anytime soon. He's still doing a pretty darn good job out there every Sunday. Hey, first star uh, for me, because I don't ever give them out, so I'm going to give one out here, those Seahawks uniforms. Bobby looking, oh, real, yes. Bobby looking real good in the throwbacks. Just want to shout yeah, that they, out, because those things were nice. Incorporate that, yeah. That needs to be the regular. 
Sam, this this is a topic for another podcast. I'm just going to say one sentence and leave it at that. 90%, 95% of all teams in sports should wear their throwbacks as their primaries. That is it. That's all. Done. That's all. Yeah, 95%. There's a loud 5% in there, though. So No, that's I, – you give, <laughs> give a little room for error, you know. But, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, Sam, those are right. well. There they are. Good, my three stars. Those are good three stars. I liked it. I was not expecting good. your number one star to be Bobby Wagner. I would have expected more like a third or a second star, but I like it. And I like to surprise the people. The people, you're giving the people what they want. We had somebody who like complained <laughs> to us. I think I don't know, four weeks ago or something. I think it was like an Instagram comment on our like locals in the end, in the NFL recap, and they're like, "What about Bobby Wagner?" I was like. We had a story up about Bobby this week. Like it was awesome. Like he had a good game. You know, like it's just funny. We used you to can, get. We used to get. On you the can never TV please side, anybody. No, on the TV side of things, we used to get a lot of heat for uh, um, uh, Taron Johnson, and and not having him in locals. And we're like, you're not watching our locals because he's in there. It's like, look, if he has two tackles in a game, are we supposed to spend 30 seconds on him? No, but we do mention that he had two tackles. And look, I'm not trying to take anything away from him. He is outstanding, but yes. Hey, you know what? I invite the listeners. I invite the viewers to chime in. Tell us who we need to give more love to. Tell us who's uh, deserving of the recognition on locals in the NFL because I would love to share some of that love. Uh, so go ahead, spout it. You know, shout it out at me if you disagree with me. I want to hear it. I like it, uh, Sam. I feel like we should mention a few other guys before we uh, yes. we move on to next week. What do you think about Thursday night football with Dalton Kincaid? How about that? Another guy with his first awesome. career touchdown. Awesome. Uh, it's been a, it's been a little bit coming, and you know, seeing I, I was talking about how happy Simi Fajoko looked after his touchdown. Dalton when he jumped up into the crowd. Like he had the biggest grin on his face. His eyes were like shut so tight because he's smiling so big. I mean, he deserves it. And and you know that the stars are aligning, the, the dominoes are lining up for his career to be a nice, long and successful one. So congrats for him getting into the end zone because, and you know, and this is a guy who's going to be playing in the postseason um, probably, right? And so uh, on a good team, uh good for him yeah uh, a couple other guys and i i watched a clip the other day and it was from uh nbc's uh pro football talk it was mike florio and uh peter king talking about zach wilson and jordan love and it's funny because we talked about it i want to say two weeks ago but we mentioned about how those guys are kind of mentioned, you know, in the same breath about how like guys coming in, having high expectations for the situations they're in, but not necessarily being given the time. And it was interesting because they kind of had a similar discussion to what we had talked about where, you know, <laughs> last week you were like talking about Jordan Love and people wanting to write him off halfway through his first year as a starter. And Peter King was like, giving the Jets credit for kind of sticking with Zach Wilson. And I was like, well, mm -hmm. yes, but they also kind of like, they had no other option this year. They kind of had to stick with <clears> Zach Wilson, <throat> but mm -hmm. it's interesting because it, that Jets game was ugly yesterday, but when it mattered most, Zach Wilson made two great throws back to back, got the team into field goal position, clocked the ball one second left. They make field goal, go to overtime, stop the Giants, get the ball back, kick a game-winning field goal. All of a sudden, Jets have won three in a row. Zach Wilson is their starting quarterback. Like, they're four and three now. They are in position where, hey, Aaron Rodgers could come back postseason. I mean, like, they still have everything in front of them in a really tough division. So, just, it's amazing what a little bit of patience right. does with these guys. Yeah. And so, with Jordan Love kind of in a little bit of a slump right now, uh, he he really struggled to finish mm -hmm. drives yesterday, especially in the fourth quarter. They turned the ball mm -hmm. over on downs in three of their uh, in their last three possessions, actually. And then um, he only had one touchdown pass earlier in the game. But I I just I want to I want to just say this is a little cautionary tale to these teams, right? Like 
let's not write everybody off. And what what they brought up as an example, Peter King and Mike Florio mentioned uh, Terry Bradshaw, and they brought up his first five years as a quarterback for the Steelers. And I want to say it was the first five seasons. It may have been four, but he threw like 41 touchdown passes, some something like that, and 70-something interceptions in his yeah. first five years as a quarterback. And then yeah. switch flips, he becomes a Hall of Fame quarterback, wins four Super Bowls, right? <laughs> like, I mean, I'm not saying that Zach Wilson or jo- and Jordan right. Love are going to be Terry Bradshaw and Hall of Fame quarterbacks. But – like they mentioned on their podcast, and I think it's uh, it's worth reiterating, like Zach Wilson has shown competence at the position the last few weeks after he kind of got his feet underneath him after the chaos that was the first you know three weeks of the season for the Jets. And I think that we need to have that same kind of thing with Jordan Love. Let's let's let it play out a little bit. I just so yeah. many people are quick to in this. I really think it's social media, like social media is the driving force of it. It's negative, negative 100 yeah, energy. And uh, I just Jordan Love does some good things. He's not quite there yet. That's okay. Right. He's a first year starter. So patience is greatly undervalued. Um, And, you know, it's, it's unfortunate because there was a lot more of it back in the day. And I think you're 100% right. Social media, the general media, all of those things put a light and a pressure on teams to succeed a lot quicker. And so the patience goes away. And so there's quick changes. You see it in coaching staffs all the time. You see it at the quarterback position all the time. Um, and th- there needs to be a little more of it. And especially for a franchise, uh, like when I think of the Jets, for a franchise that hasn't been great for that long, what's another couple of years? Be patient. And I know you want to fix something. And when you had Aaron Rodgers in, I get it. But <laughs> look, come for the three stars. Stay for the Zach Wilson hot take. Here we go. Um, I have, I have kind of two sides to this Zach Wilson, whatever it is and however you're going to do it, he's got to get out of his own head when it comes to it. And I think we're seeing that, but, but you pointed out those two passes that he had at the end of regulation, amazing plays. He was quick, great throws. Those are the throws we saw during pro day. Those were the throws we saw at BYU all the time. Why? Because he didn't have time to think about it. He had to get up there, snap the ball, and make a friggin' play. You know, he had to go and do that. And he did it. And he was awesome. And they hurried up to the line. They were able to get the ball spiked uh, with enough time to get the field goal, which we didn't see uh, in the, what was it, a few weeks ago when he, they were trying to spike the ball. That You know, yeah, he's learning. He, yes, he's showing progress. We're seeing it. That is outstanding. Stick with it somehow. I don't know how you do it with the coaching or with Zach himself, but somehow get him out of his head and, and just let him rip too, right? Just let him go out there and and play the way he plays football. Now, my other take has a lot less to do with Zach and a lot more to do with Zach Wilson fans. And I know <laughs> I might tick some people off. Come at me. I don't care. But I'm tired of seeing the apologists out there for Zach Wilson too. There's there's one fan in particular I saw on social media who is like, just you know, after Zach made those passes, was just just all this is you know everyone's saying he's garbage. I'm like, well, okay, go back and watch the first 58 minutes of that game and tell me how Zach Wilson was. He wasn't great, right? Or or however many minutes, whatever. But I am not bagging on Zach either. It's like, look, I, I yeah. want to be as real as possible. He's not that good of a quarterback yet. I'll throw that word in there because I still believe he has the skill set and the tools to be a good NFL quarterback. Right. It's just going to take more time. It's those, it's those flashes that you see that like, where you're like, as, as he continues to put more and more of those on film, like it's like, it's piecing it together where it's like those two throws back to back, getting them into field goal position, clocking the ball in time, like all that stuff. Like when you see those things being put together, it gives you the confidence that like, it's a progression. He's continuing to build off it as opposed to being like, wow, here's one awesome throw. And then he throws three more of them and they're all picked off. Right. Like, it's like, you can't have the two steps forward, one step back. It needs to be like three, four five steps forward, one step back. You can still have some of those mistakes, but yeah, it's a, it was interesting. I did think it was, it was funny because I, I know we're running long on Zach here, but I do think it's worth mentioning. He 
has had a number of drops this year. And especially in that game too, he had quite a few receivers drop passes that I thought were catchable. Yeah. And that's something yeah. where fans don't necessarily, you know, see it after the fact, right. like maybe in the moment right. they see, Oh yeah, the receiver should have caught that ball. But then at the end of the game, it's like, Oh my gosh, Zach Wilson was like 47% completion rate today. Well, yeah, you see that on the box score. Everybody that didn't watch the game that looks at the box score sees that and is like, my gosh, Zach had a terrible game. And like, was it great? No. But at the end of the day, like when the coaches are looking at it, when the film study is happening in the Jets facility, they're taking those things into account, which yes, I think is, is something that's worthwhile is where it's like, okay, their scope of what they're looking at with Zach is greater than what the average fan is looking at on the TV screen. So. Yeah, I agree. Just thought I'd hey, bring up. I'm going to I'm going to shift our our momentum forward here. I'm going to ask you a question here, Kyle. Should Okay, two questions. Do the Vikings start Jaron Hall and should they start Jaron Hall? That's two different questions. How about we take a quick break and then I'll oh, come back and answer yes. that. Yes. Yes. All right, welcome back to the Yards After College podcast here with uh, Kyle Ireland and Sam Farnsworth at KSLSports.com and the KSL Sports app. Uh, we left you just before the break with a question, Kyle, a two-part question, because yesterday, Sunday, we saw the uh, Kirk Cousins, the starting quarterback of the Minnesota Vikings, go down with an Achilles tear. He is done for the year. Um, it's unfortunate. I, I've loved watching Kirk Cousins play this year. It's been Fun to see him emerge. He's having the best year of his career. But with him down, the doorway opens for one of our locals, Spanish Fork, Utah native, Maple Mountain High School. He's from Spanish Fork, BYU. It's Jaron Hall. This is what we're getting at. And the door is open there. But the question now becomes, and it's a two-parter for me to you, Kyle, should the Vikings go with Jaron Hall? Uh, the first question is, will they go with Jaron Hall this week? And the second question is, should they go with Jaron Hall? Tish, I don't know how to answer either one of those. And I feel like I would I would like this podcast to be recorded on Wednesday instead of Monday. So that would be the, <laughs> the trade deadline. So we know. Would, would be passed. So that way I would know for sure. Um, I saw, uh, I won't give it out there because i don't think he's a reputable uh nfl reporter but i did see some stuff floated on social media that the uh the vikings might try to go after like a guy like Jameis winston from the saints i don't interesting i don't necessarily like disagree with the take um i just don't think that the sourcing from what i've seen in the past from this person uh is reputable but i wouldn't i wouldn't be shocked if that's something that like the vikings are exploring now Going back to your question, I think that, yes, they will go with Jaron Hall this week. Moving forward, are we talking through the end of this season or are we talking going mm -hmm. into next year? Because Kirk Cousins was in the last year of his deal this year. Right. And so it was either going to be after this season, we're re-signing Kirk or we're moving ahead, looking towards the future with a guy like Jaron Hall or somebody else. <clears throat> so. I think it guess it depends on which one of those you're looking at. Um, like you said, Kirk was having an awesome year. So like, do they say it's, it's interesting because it's not like an Aaron Rodgers situation, right? Where he's under contract for next year. So it's like, Oh, if Aaron Rodgers wants to play, like the jets are going to play Aaron Rodgers next year where mm -hmm. Kirk is not going to be, you know, under contract when it comes to March. And so I, I just, I think that what, what makes it difficult is the Vikings had a really slow start and, and now, now they're looking to be like in a position where they could fight for the division or a wild card, you know, playoff spot. I would like to see what Kevin O'Connell and the Vikings yeah. coaching staff has seen from Jaron Hall in right. train in training camp and throughout the first eight weeks of the season, because that would give me a better idea of if, he, if Jaron was ready. Because if you asked me this question in August, I would say no. Um, but I don't know. Maybe Jaron is ready. Jaron's a really mature player. We mm -hmm. saw that at BYU. Um, even in his post-game remarks yesterday, like he talks like a guy who's been in the league for five years, yeah. right? 
He's just yeah. super mature. He's got a good head on him. And so I, I would like to see Jaron Hall get some time this next week. I think he'll start just based off of the fact that even if you bring in a new quarterback, um, right. I think Sean Mannion is their their other quarterback that's healthy on the yes. roster right now. He's on their practice squad, so they'll probably elevate him. He'll be their backup. Nick Mullins, um, Kevin O'Connell was saying is, you know, going to come back off of IR. I think he's got two weeks left on IR. Week 10. Then, yeah, week yeah, 10. We'll, we'll see what, what things look like as far as his injury and coming back if, you know, because you you don't necessarily have to come back after the four games, right? Like you could be on IR right. for the rest of the year. So we'll see yeah. what they do with that. I will say, and you put this out on uh, on social media as well. Mm-hmm. I think that the Vikings will bring in another quarterback this week, mm-hmm. but they're going to roll Jaron against. Uh, I don't even know who they play this week. I didn't even look at the schedule yet. Um, so in week nine, Jaron Hall is going to get the start. I hundred percent believe that, but I don't know. I can't answer the the second question until I know what yeah, Wednesday looks like, Sam. Yeah. So they're facing the Falcons um, at Atlanta. I think, you know, I, I think that's a good matchup to bring in a guy like Jaron to give him an opportunity. So here's the thing. This is what I look at when I think of the the Vikings roster. Had Nick Mullins not gotten hurt and been put on IR, Jaron would still be the number three quarterback on this roster. Yep. It's not saying that it's not saying that he's not good enough, or it's maybe not even saying that he's not ready yet, but it shows a lot of what the Vikings think of Jaron that maybe he's not ready yet, that they're developing him. They had enough confidence in him to elevate him to number two, QB two behind Kirk Cousins. Uh, when Nick Mullins went on IR without having to go and seek somewhere else to add another quarterback. So they had that confidence in him and and they should, he was a fifth round pick, you know, the, yeah. you gotta, you gotta, you gotta have confidence in the guy. Um, but I just don't know that he's quite there yet. So, and, and my, my big concern for Jaron is that you don't want to ruin him by throwing him out too soon. I'm sure Jaron feels ready. I'm sure he wants to go out there and play. Yeah. But if the coaches feel like he's not quite there yet, I would rather, as a Minnesota Viking, if I'm a Minnesota Vikings fan, I would rather them go out and sign a veteran and bring him in and start him this week already to kind of save Jaron from going out there and, and, and becoming a head case or something like that. You know, uh, I don't want that to happen to a guy who's got enough skills and talent to potentially become um, a, a starting quarterback someday. Uh, O'Connell today in his in his press remarks did say that um, he wanted when Jaron was in the game, it was primarily a situation where they were going to run the ball. But he called pass plays because he wanted to let Jaron play the quarterback position. But he also kind of wanted to get a look at how he handled uh, some of those plays. And and he said that he already got feedback from guys in the huddle. So we're talking Jaron's teammates, Jaron's teammates saying that uh, he had outstanding he was outstanding calling plays, cadence, snap counts, uh, center quarterback exchange, um, all those things. According to his teammates in the huddle, they all felt like he was doing very well at that. So that says a lot. His teammates are confident in him. They trust him. Uh, we'll just see if if he's ready to be a starter. I'm okay with him sitting if he needs to sit for a little bit longer i'm okay with that but do i selfishly want to see jaron hall start an nfl game yes 100 percent. i want to see him go out there and see what he can do and maybe he can really uh you know light the world on fire yeah no i think you're i think you're spot on there it's a it's a harsh reality when you get thrust into a game and all of a sudden everything's coming at you i mean granted like it was good that they had a two touchdown lead. They were just trying to ice the game away. I think that like that's better mm-hmm. to come in that situation than being down two touchdowns and trying to make something happen. But you saw he got stripped of the ball, you know, on the third snap that he was in. And it's like, yeah. oh, okay. Like that's I I feel like because they were able to win the game, it was kind of already in hand. Like that's a good it's easier to learn from mistakes when you win, right? Than than to have those mistakes come in at a loss. So I think that that's he had kind this, of... He had this one pass over the middle. I can't remember who he threw it to. It might have been uh, um, Hawkinson. Is that their tight end? 
Yeah, that was on the that was on his second possession. Yeah, right, right. And what impressed me about that one pass was they were backed up against their own goal line, and just watching Jaron hang in the pocket, the pocket formed around him. He st- stood up in the pocket, stood tall, even though he's right there at his goal line, and then he made a good throw. Uh, that impressed me because a rookie quarterback could get flustered pretty easily when he's seen defenders starting to fall all around him. Yeah, no, for sure. Well, Sam, before we uh, we talk about next week, because I do want to see if that's the game of the week that you want to pick, but I want to start a new segment with you. And I think we're just going to call it Kyle's, Kyle's Fun Stat of the Week because that's got a nice ring to it, right? And this week... KFSW. Yeah, this week for KFSW. It's like an old, it's like an old radio station. <laughs> I love it. This week... For Kyle's fun stat of the week, we're going to go give a little shout out to at Cougar Stats uh, on X, Twitter, whatever we're calling it. Uh, BYU fans, I'm sure, are familiar with this account. But during the games yesterday, I happened to see something come across my uh, BYU list that I have set up. And I thought it was a good stat. And so shout out to Cougar Stats for this. But Sam, did you know? that yesterday in week eight was the first time since 1996 week 16 that three BYU quarterbacks attempted a pass in the NFL same week Impressive. first time in you know what is that almost 30 years crazy craziness so 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 who are who are who are the three I, quarterbacks I think I know the answer but give them to me well, so 1996, it's clearly Steve Young, clearly, right? With the 49ers Steve Young, in, his Steve Young. in his prime. Yes, um, Steve Young is one. I would like to say uh, Ty Detmer. Ty Detmer is the second one. Was You're he on, on the roll. Eagles? Does it, does it say who he was with? I feel like he was on the Eagles at the time. I should have looked this up. I will look it up. That's I'll look right. it up right. Okay. I'll look it up right now while while you're guessing the second or sorry the third one. Uh, well, the third one, and I think I know what team he might have been on too. Okay, the third one is going to be Jim McMahon, and I want to say he was on the Vikings at the time. So, which Jim would Mc... be kind of cool because uh, that's where Jaron was at. But Jim, Jim McMahon, McMahon was a backup by then. He is the third. But... And he was not with the Vikings in 96, but you were uh, correct. Definitely. You were correct. Well, with... he wasn't on the E. You were correct with the, was Eagles, with the Eagles and Ty Detmer. Yep. He was on the Eagles okay. in 96. In 96, so this was, was, this was Jim's Bay? last year. Yep. Last year with Green Bay. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Very cool. I know he was there a backup with the Eagles. I feel like he was a backup with the Vikings. Uh, Green Bay. All right, cool. Anyway, I like so the there, stat, Kyle. Yeah, there's the, uh, the fun stat of the week. We'll we'll do this moving forward. We'll try and make them all fun like this. But I, I like I like having a little throwback aspect to the uh, locals in the NFL because we talk about the current guys, but sometimes the former guys are. It's fun to to go retro on this. So local maybe, throwbacks. Maybe we'll do That's that moving uh, uh, moving forward as well. Here's, here's one more real quick, and it's not a stat, but just a tidbit. The Broncos broke a 14, was it 14, 15, 16 game win, losing streak against the Chiefs, whatever it was. They haven't beaten yeah. the Chiefs since they won the Super Bowl in 2015 when I covered them. The last time they beat the Chiefs, Alex Smith was the starting quarterback for Kansas City. Yeah, Alex so. Smith versus Peyton Manning. So there's, that's a throwback to you. Both of those guys yeah. are out of the league and have been out of the league for <laughs> <laughs> two, three years now. So crazy. My gosh, that is, that's wild. That good, good on your Broncos, Sam. And how about Garrett Bowles coming off the field? Yeah. Just all hyped up. That was awesome. Congrats to Garrett. He had a good, good for game. Him. Good for them and the, the Broncos. My goodness. All right, Sam, before we wrap this up, game of the week next week for you, who do you got? Kyle, you know how I hate those early morning Sunday Europe games. But holy cow, how do we not wake up for the Dolphins and Chiefs at 7.30 in the yeah. morning on Sunday? I'll, I'll tell you this. I, I can already promise you 
that when I wake up Sunday morning, it won't be to watch the chiefs. I've got some other things I have to take <laughs> care of, but, but, uh, but that's a great matchup. Unfortunately, it's at a time where uh, I probably won't be watching. So that's not going to be the game I'm going to pick this week. Um, I'm going with the Bills and Bengals. It kind of feels like the Bengals might be back. They might be returning to that, um, you know, maybe Super Bowl contender. But this is going to be a game that's going to really kind of iron that out a little bit. Is it the Bills? Is it the Bengals? Who's going to be one of those front runners in the AFC? I like it. Sunday night football on KSL five TV at six twenty PM on uh Sunday, November fifth. Sam, I'm also going prime time. I'm going Monday night football. You got the Chargers at the New York Jets. Oh. I like it. I think that that is a very fun mm. matchup. Chargers coming off a big win on Sunday night football, and I want to see if they keep it rolling against a good Jets defense. I want to see if Zach Wilson can follow up another primetime game like he did against the Chiefs on Sunday Night Football a few weeks ago with a Monday Night Football performance against a Chargers defense that has some players on it, but I think is uh, able to be exploited maybe on the outside. Um, Unfortunate for a guy like Michael Michael Davis, former BYU corner, but I feel like he's been getting picked on, and I want to see if the Jets try and uh, take advantage of those safeties, uh, they've had some injuries there. Lohi Gilman's been banged up the last few weeks. And so I just, I think it's an interesting matchup. Both teams are kind of coming into that game feeling good about themselves. So want to see uh, how that game plays out on Monday Night Football. Good pick. Zach Wilson in primetime. All right, Kyle. Um, that's it. I think that's it this week. Am I wrong? Are we missing something? No, that's it. Pretty it's- good week. A lot me, going on. I feel like that was the most jam-packed week we've had this fu- so far this season. It was season, a lot. Sam. I was I was dead yesterday. After I like got done working, I was like, I am tired. Like that was a long day yesterday. So we still have Monday night football tonight. We got the Lions and the Raiders. So a couple of local guys, uh, one on either side uh tonight. So uh got Penny Sewell and Andre James, both mm-hmm. offensive linemen for their respective teams. So That'll be fun tonight. But Sam, what what can you tease as far as uh, KSL Sports Live this week before we say goodbye? KSL Sports Live, you can watch it streaming on the KSL TV app and uh, or live on your television, KSL Channel 5, the NBC affiliate in Salt Lake City, Utah. Uh, we will have a jam-packed show again this weekend with lots and lots of football. That's all we do this time of year because we still have high school playoffs going on. Uh, 4A, 5A, 6A in the quarterfinals. The classifications below that are in the semifinals. And then the Utes, Cougars, Aggies, all in action. Can BYU become bowl eligible uh, with a big road game at West Virginia? Utes at home. Oh, wait, are they at home? They're on the road, I think. Arizona State. I don't know, but they're playing Arizona State. Uh, can they bounce back? We'll have it all this weekend as well as all the NFL coverage too. And the Jazz. Right. I know this is an NFL podcast, but we've got the Jazz, too. Hey, this is the time of year, Sam. I love this time of year. I love That's great World October, Series. October to February. It's awesome because you have everything. Yep. You've got baseball wrapping up, soccer wrapping up, hockey and basketball getting underway. Football is in the heat of things, and it's just it's awesome. It's great. It's the best time to be a sports fan. Beautiful. Good deal. All right, Sam. Well, well, that was awesome, man. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, Kyle. That was a good time once again, and uh, we'll be back in next week. Uh, that's it. That's it for you. That's it for me. I don't normally sign out, but I'm doing it this time, Kyle. We'll see you next week on the Yards After College Podcast.